Hi, my name's Lathan. And I'm Anne Marie. Thank you for taking the time to watch the pilot episode of Bridge a Table. So many cities have been hit by the events of the last two years, but Portland has taken its own unique set of hits, namely by mainstream news outlets and the social media memes that they inspired. This has affected worldwide public perception of our city by people who aren't even part of this community, which affects tourism, which hurts local businesses and the community at large. We're protective of our city and the restaurants we love. As two people who are proud of Portland and its incredible food scene, we wanted to create this passion project. It's our intention to create a show highlighting Portland's greatness through the lens of the culinary industry. And this is a grassroots community effort. So please subscribe to this channel, like the video, share a link to your social media pages, and please do engage with us. So far, this has been completely self-funded. So if you'd like to help us fund future episodes, see our link in the description below. This will help us get more crew and release episodes faster. Thank you in advance and enjoy the show. Thank you. I think the media made it seem like all of Portland was on fire, and that was not the case. The city has a lot of cleanup to do, it has a lot of healing to do, but I think talking about it in a negative way is not helping at all. It's important to highlight all the good things that are still happening and all the revitalization that's happening in the city because it's never going to be quite the same, but it's going to be better in a different way. The people who are telling the story need to help us, not hurt us. If there's a bad thing to say, say it, be true, be honest. But we need, as a community, we need to come together and try to make this thing better. Because we had a paradise in this city for 10 plus years. A dining scene that was really dynamic, really exciting, really fresh, and also had this weird invisible barrier of everybody working together as neighbors. Pretty cool. You know, part of what I did was I, you know, I traveled around the country and I would eat at some of the best restaurants in the country. So I had a, like a sense of like what was happening uh, nationally. People would ask me about Portland all the time, you know, people in New York. And really they were tapping Portland because so many of the trends were happening in Portland. But when you're in Portland, you're not aware of the trends because you're just in, you're just in it, right? But as an outsider looking in, so many things that were happening were happening in Portland first. or they were doing it in such a way that was really unique, special that other people were taking notice of. Great food things were happening in Portland. Amazing farm to table. Greg Higgins rode his bicycle out here from New York and started his restaurant and said, hey, the farmer who made this vegetable is this rock star. Let's put their name on the menu. And that was kind of the first of that movement here. The food culture in Portland allows a lot of different people to come in and people are really excited to come try the food. It's home to some of the best restaurants and eateries in the country. Where chefs come here to really cook for themselves and that was very telling because you can tell when someone is cooking with their heart and soul. The chefs put so much love and effort into making the food that they serve great. There's also a lot of choices. You can go to a fine dining restaurant or you can go to food carts. 
We have so much access to high quality seasonal foods, produce, meats, cheeses. So we're really spoiled as far as that's concerned. This is the land of fertile soil, so things just grow crazy here. People are friendly, you walk down the street, say hi to somebody, they'll say hi back. The people, the trees, rivers, everything. The cleanest air, the cleanest rivers, this amazing Pacific Ocean. I mean, we live in such a beautiful place. Not only is it beautiful to look at, but it creates beautiful ingredients for chefs to work with. Our farmers and our winemakers were our neighbors as well. They live 20 minutes away. So they come in, they make the stuff, they drop off the cool stuff, they go home, they, they put on a nicer shirt, and they come back and have dinner. That dynamic of where the stuff comes from, who prepares it, and then gives it to the public, all of those lines in Portland were blurred. We were really just growing as a city, as a place that is known for being creative and known for being community-based and small business oriented. Everyone started working from home. And in the beginning, it's even hard to do takeout because you don't know whether or not there's going to be a virus when people are touching the food. We just wanted to break even, but, but it was hard to break even. And so we were bleeding out for sure. And at the same time, we were also scared because of getting sick or being exposed, but we had to work because we had no income. We had no choice. An email or phone call goes out, I forget, from other restaurant owners and they're like, hey, we gotta meet. We need to sit down and talk about this. So we went to the back room of Ava Jean's and I'm like 10 minutes late to the meeting and I'm like, there's gonna be 10 of us. I open the door and it's like 70 people. There's a table in the middle with like 10 people seated and then the entire walls are lined, standing room only. The agenda was like, we need to form an alliance because of this stuff shuts us down. We need to have some, some weight, some power to talk to our government and to get money and to get, you know, some kind of, you know, ways for them to help us. We need to have a voice. And the meeting breaks up, it's Friday the 13th, and um, we, we go back to our businesses. I kind of bang the drum with nervous employees of like, we're gonna be okay. This is just a thing, so let's not worry about it. Surprisingly, I don't think I was ever nervous that we were ever gonna have to close. I'm extremely hard work and I would figure, figure out a way to get through it. We shut down the initial six weeks that they, they asked us to do to help with like the PPEs, but we couldn't afford to be shut down much longer after that. I really was convinced that after a couple weeks, we would be able to reopen. But as the quarantine set in, it started to become financially really complicated. People who don't work in the industry don't realize that the profit margins are so slim and the people who are working in those restaurants, they don't have that safety, that nest egg. They don't have a backup plan often for no fault of their own, you know, it's just they don't have it and the whole industry doesn't have it. Having a child who was at home and the emotional needs of them, but also not knowing when they were going back to school, really started to feel impossible to reopen and function on any level. So I wrote a letter, sent it out to the entire staff, and I said, if you're waiting for my phone call right now, don't. If you have an opportunity, take it. And if we do reopen, I was like, I don't know if we're gonna reopen with 55 people on staff. I think this is gonna be a long battle. And if we come out of it, it's gonna be a slow slog. The difficulty of getting fresh fruits and produce and cleaning product and worrying about the people who are coming in and bringing in the product and how you keep a space sterile, how you keep a space safe. We tried doing uh, online delivery services, but they just charge way too much. Food cost for a barbecue joint is already pretty high since we are just selling meat. Uh, and the 30% that they wanted was just too much for us. Also, burgers don't sit very well. People across the industry, you know, very worried, very worried. And I remember 
being really impressed and proud of how people have pivoted and how quickly they turned and how resourceful restaurants got and trying to uh, keep their lights on, you know? Ultimately, I feel like creativity extends far beyond a dish or a dining experience. Our original concept was probably the, the type of concept with, that would have the most trouble reopening because it requires a diner to sit for two hours in a room. Currently, we have four staff members and we can run the bakery with just three of us and be fine and survive the pandemic. But I already offered a job to someone and they ended up moving here and committing to me. So that's why we actually started Night Market. So Night Market essentially just pays for their wage. Do you think of that? No. Lucky for us, we're, to, we're take out by nature. We're pick up by nature. So we were pretty much set up for COVID. People were like, well, I'm not gonna be coming in to buy coffee every day. So let me come in and buy beans. I really like this drink that you guys serve. Can I get it in a large format, right? Instead of getting a cup, can I get a half a gallon? People in Portland tip generously. And I know this because I talked to restaurateurs. They tipped more than they had to because they understood that those tips were going directly to those employees. And those employees really needed those. Because downtown was so quiet, we had to create specials just to like bring people downtown just for certain dishes. Um, so we did a lot of off-menu items just to create dishes, whatever we can do. We were very fortunate to get several aid packages uh, that helped us rent, helped with paying our employees and letting them keep their hours. Luckily, we kind of after that hit an uptrend of business. We were allowed to seat outside. All our tables are already six feet apart. Everybody was compliant with wearing masks. I think people were just happy to be able to go out. Even if it was still sitting outside and it might be raining, it was worth it. They're literally breaking windows in mom and pop shops and mom and pop restaurants. And it makes me sad that people think that's okay to do. As it got closer to our cart, we kind of got a little nervous. You keep your fingers crossed the whole entire time. I did a road trip and I got to the middle of America and people would be like, oh, Portland, huh? Are you guys ever gonna get it figured out down there? And my response was always, the videos and the things that you see are sensationalized versions of Portland. All that is happening within a concise few blocks in downtown. The rest of the city is pretty much fine. Luckily, nothing happened to our cart. You know, and most, for the most part, all carts were pretty safe. The fact that the national news made it feel more dangerous than it was, I felt that that was a disservice to the city. It was irresponsible journalism because when you report stuff like that and it's not accurate, you're affecting people's livelihoods. These are jobs where people are uh, afraid to go certain places when they really shouldn't be. There were people, and a lot of black people and a lot of black groups that were trying to create a protest that was for us, by us, which I loved and respected and appreciated. But when it was all going on, I kind of had my work phase of it, and then I had my outside of work phase, which was kind of this balance of like, this is interesting, I want to go check out these protests and really see what it's about. Oh, it's just a bunch of white people going a little wild and getting beat up by the police. I'm not trying to get beat up because some white dude threw a can, of, I'm not doing it. If you want to go protest for the sake of police brutality and black people dying in the streets on the regular, I have a thousand percent for that. I respect it. But at the end of the day, there was a lot of things going on that I just really couldn't get behind as well. Within a lot of the protest rioting situation, it was a lot of people just like coming into town as if it's some kind of like attraction. And that is when I really started to distance myself from it. People kept telling me all the time, like, hey man, I'm fighting for you. I'm like, I didn't ask you to go outside. <laughs> what, I, what I need you to actually do is come inside and buy this coffee, <laughs> you know? Like, I don't need you to be outside at night. It's absolutely true. Portland was very upset about what had happened in this country. And it's because people in Portland care. It's a city of passionate people. And so I'm very proud of the fact that we protested and we made national news. There's a lot of people in Portland that was really trying to put on for our city, but it's gonna be easy to get diluted. The funny thing that COVID did pre-George Floyd 
was like it really made you sit and understand what was taking place in your life and you got really in tune with yourself so that when the things with George Floyd happened we actually were focused on it we kind of got out of our own way for a little bit or we could really see and then protest it so it just brought to, to light the fact that there aren't a lot of representation around businesses of, of people of color and women and it really did just like bring up the things to the surface everybody went into survival mode and so i think we all had to stretch ourselves in ways we didn't know how to and in ways that were just not sustainable we want to move forward with something that we can create and that we can control because right now there's a lot of uncertainty the concept was just kind of cook food we liked cooking instead of working for somebody else. Start small, don't worry about making a lot of money. Just do what makes us happy and hopefully it'll make other people happy. We're feeling super hopeful. Just the past couple of months have been great. Summer's gonna be great. I'm not here to cook food. I'm here to create an experience with food. From the initial greeting in the window to the time you pick up your food and you walk away, it's all about the experience. And so the food's just the bonus, basically. So you're having a bad day, you come to Mama Chow's kitchen, we're gonna do our best to change that bad day of yours, you know, with a bowl of food and maybe our presence for that short period of time. Everything is for sure the people that we work with, man. It wasn't a bunch of coffee people, it was like a bunch of friends who learned about coffee. The people create the culture. Nothing else, no amount of money, no amount of hype, no amount of anything else. Friendship, vibrance, that dope conversation. We're hiring more staff than before. We're gonna be offering all of our employees paid health care and dental. Another thing that I'm really excited for going forward is just the improved quality of life and more sustainable atmosphere within this restaurant. It's okay to say no to some things. It's okay to slow down, and slowing down or restricting certain things is not failing. It's just being more aware of what your needs are. Coming out of this, uh, hopefully people will continue to understand, you know, shopping local, spending local, staying local as much as you can. Like, don't be a nerd about it, <laughs> you know, but, but as much as you can, it really does matter, you know? <laughs> I'm really excited about where Portland is going. There's so many restaurants opening back up again and opening up to more people going into restaurants. I'm just excited. I feel like it's, it's going to be such a great summer for our, our Portland community. Just like we were all so naive, the world was so naive, and this awful thing happened to everybody. And so we're all a little bit different. We're all gonna come out of it okay. We're all gonna be a little bit different. Um, but that doesn't mean we're not gonna be great again. There's a book called Pattern Language that talks about uh, designing spaces where you're always walking into the light. So like we're leaving a lit space right now, a small hallway of darkness to enter another lit space. The state of things in the restaurant scene, the restaurants are gonna be fine. Feeling it in my 